Welcome. I'm Stephen Winnick of the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress. For many years, we've presented the Homegrown Concert Series, presenting the best in folk and traditional music from around the world. In the year 2020, because of the global pandemic, we shifted to producing an online video concert series, and we call it Homegrown at Home. So now in 2021, this is our second year of Homegrown at Home concerts. And we were very happy to team up with the Embassy of Finland to present the group Karde Mimit. So I am here now to interview two members of the group Karde Mimit. So welcome to you. And, Thank you. and I should say that uh, one of the challenges that I have in doing these interviews is pronouncing the names of people from a wide variety of cultures. So rather than introducing you, why don't I ask you to introduce yourselves by telling our viewers your names? So my name is Anna, and the last name is Vegelius, which is similar to my identical sister right here. <laughs> yes, we have the same surname. So I, my name is Leni Vegelius, and we come from the band Gardemimi. So you got that pretty. Thank <laughs> Thank you as, so much. As well as it could be. <laughs> <laughs> right. We have right. Hard language. So um, I guess to begin, I, I've been told that you actually have an, an in-person gig tonight. And we, we started most of our 2020 interviews by asking people uh, how they were doing in the pandemic. So I guess the question now is, is how are you doing in the recovery? How, how are things going for the band and for music in general in your part of the world? Yeah, it looks like things are coming back to life, I guess. Uh, my phone my phone number is the dance phone number, so it's been ringing quite a lot, which is weird, because the last time I was called, it, my, it was my dad two weeks ago, and then suddenly <laughs> seven people called me uh, within two days to ask about concerts. So I guess we're coming back, and tonight we have a kind of surprise concert with a Finnish Ministry of Work. It's I think of they, labor, yeah. yeah, of labor. They have some kind of an event they asked us last week to come. Nice. And now we have this interview and a concert <laughs> during the same evening. So it's busy. <laughs> yes, very appropriate that as musicians, uh, and when it's your work, and that you get to play at the at the uh, Ministry of Labor uh, mm -hmm. and, and when the economy is starting to open back up. So so that's wonderful. So let's talk about your, your music. And I think what we'll do is we'll talk about Finnish music in general and history, and then talk about the band specifically um, next. So, so I know that you specialize in songs that feature the kantele, uh, an important Finnish musical instrument. So, explain to us the history a little bit of the kantele. So, kantele is a very old instrument. It's uh, like archaic instrument, and uh, it has uh, several strings. Uh, maybe from five to about 40, but the bigger cantiles are much newer. So the five string cantile is the oldest one. And one string only makes one uh, sound or one note. So mm -hmm. uh, unlike guitars or uh, violins or stuff like that. So it's similar to a harp in that way. And uh, it's a common European instrument or Northern Baltic, yeah, Baltic and Russia also has its version of Kandeles, so it's not only Finnish instrument, but um, in Finland it has preserved quite well the tradition and we uh, have recordings from the early 1900s and 1800s that are probably quite similar to what people have been playing for several hundreds of years. So because Finland is a remote country, so we have our own traditions that have preserved uh, maybe longer than in Central Europe, where they had a more culture that traveled all around. Mm -hmm. So we have our own specific things here. <laughs> Wonderful. And and <clears throat> I understand that most of your music actually is our original songs that you've written, but you've used some of the traditions of Finland in in the music that you create. So are there different sort of regional styles of playing cantare that you've uh, ad adapted into your work? Yes, quite uh, a lot of, we use quite uh, like a lot of Eastern tradition, uh, which is um, more of a small cantare tradition. And then we have Western tradition, which is more of the, uh, the bigger instrument, um, cantare with um, more strings. Uh, and it's actually a tradition that is 
still alive these days. Uh, we could say that the Eastern Kandala tradition kind of died off uh, after the early 1900s. Um, it was more of tradition of the very quiet villages. So, so maybe kind of the tradition died before uh, it could be revived. Mm -hmm. But the Western Kandala tradition, we also, me and Leni and also Jutta, the third member from our band, and actually also Maya. We have all played mm -hmm. with uh, Western Kantele masters. We've been playing with a um, player called Erki Lassila. He is exactly 50 years older than us, so he is 82 <laughs> at the moment, because we are the same age. <laughs> and and we have had a, the privilege to study with him. So we are kind of also links in the same tradition but also we are academically educated musicians so so yeah it depends on your way of thinking if we are true folk musicians or are we not yeah but i i wouldn't say that i'm a like true folk musician i'm too educated to be that but i we know a lot of tradition because we've been studying since we were kids that finish folk tradition so we use that a lot in our own original music. Also the singing styles, not only Kantele styles, but a lot of uh, Finnish singing styles and also European singing styles because Finland doesn't have harmonies in singing. So uh, we like to add those to our music. So we yeah. use different cultures. We've been borrowing from some other Pino Ugric uh, nations mm. for the kind of styles of what kind of harmonies we make, but also we have invented kind of our very own way of singing harmonies, I think. Uh, it's maybe quite our signature kind of style, and it's not strictly traditional. You could no, say that, I maybe guess. it actually comes from the style that Kandele, we play mm -hmm. Kandele also in the same kind of harmonies, mm -hmm. like close harmonies, seconds and stuff like that. Mm. Interesting. So you mentioned the different repertoire that exists in Finnish tradition and that you've also drawn upon in your songwriting. And and reading more about the band, you, you'll you'll encounter uh, words like runo songs and reiki songs. So could you explain those two forms of song a little bit? Yeah, well, runo song is maybe a larger group of songs. It's the older tradition of Finland and also Karelia, so not only Finland, but we have uh, like a sibling nation, Karelia. It's not the same as Finland, but um, there is this kind of a language that was used as a song. So um, there were stories that were told by singing, and there is a specific um, meter meter to these songs. Uh, it's very hard to explain in short, but they have eight syllables and uh, there are no rhymes, but that the rhymes are at the beginning of words. So like, it has a name in English, but I can't remember it right now. But yeah, yeah. But, yeah. so uh, this is a uh, runo song and uh, then a reiki, uh, that was the Eastern uh, tradition, runo. runo. It used to be everywhere in Finland, but uh, latest it was only in, yeah, in the eastern part. Right longest in, in eastern part. Yeah, but uh, then the western part has had reggae song and also polska song and many different kinds of small like dancing tune songs that young people uh, specifically used to sing when they were dancing. So like mm -hmm. accompanying dancing with these small songs that uh, the same melody could be sung with several or every other uh, lyrics that they were called reggae. So that you could combine melodies and uh, words from different sources. So that way you could keep singing for a long time and you could change the singer in between and they could add their verses. And and it was like a social gathering type of uh, singing. It's not, none of the Finnish tradition is actually a state, any kind of stage music. It's Mm -hmm. Kantele music was maybe more shamanic in a way, and later on it was maybe the accompanying uh, dancing. And so, where these songs they had uh, different social meanings, yeah. like probably every other <laughs> uh, older music culture has. Yeah, and Runo song was also like educational music, uh, the stories, and then about religion, the old religion, and re religious stories, and explaining the world. like kind of meanings to those sort of songs. 
mythological stories of yeah kind of, of like bigger songs reiki songs were more uh, like everyday songs and runo songs sometimes were huge like epic stories mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it was essentially i think from runo songs that the that the kalevala was constructed is that right yes yes that's yeah. true elias lenruth uh, he uh, was a man who gathered these different runo lyrics and then he kind of composed his own um more logical version of our uh, tradition and he kind of changed a little bit of names to make it a, an epic but yes yeah that was, well, all of the stories i think they can be found yes. still in the folk tradition so yeah, mm. yeah and, and the reason i mention that is that uh within our collections we have some field recordings of people singing runo songs probably influenced by the written versions in the Kalevala. And mm. one of them is about the origin of the Kantele. Um, mm. And so that that's online on our website and viewers can go and find uh, that song if they want to hear a Finnish man singing about that in this style that you're talking about. Um, mm. So a, a, a third component of the music that people mention when talking about you is the dance music. Um, uh, so could you talk a little bit about dance music styles that you've used in your in your songs as well? Yeah, I think we use a lot of uh, shottis, so something that goes in four. Uh, shottis, I think, uh, mm -hmm. like the European common name for the thing. And then Polska and Waltz. Polska and Waltz both go to three. And what else do we use? Um, actually, we... <laughs> Our music is not so easy dance because uh, we had a note from our sound technician a few days ago that it would be nice if we could compose a tune that go in one, two, three, four because he had a bit of a problem creating a click for um because we can't sing tonight in the concert so we have to play on top of our own singing I and see. he was trying to create there a so click many, that would yeah. go with it and it was hard. There are so many irregularities <laughs> in our music. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it seems like we compose very organically and they tend not to be uh, exactly in any kind of, um, what's that, uh, time signature? Yeah, mm. or at least they don't stay in the same Yeah, signature. but there's a lot of like uh, elements <laughs> from dancing mm -hmm. music and obviously, yeah. Mm. But I think mostly our songs are still there, not instrumental, so we take a lot more from the singing tradition than from the dancing or playing tradition mm -hmm. sometimes. Maya from our band, she would know more about this because Maya has kind of studied more of the, uh, mm -hmm. the element of Kandela in, in dancing music. So ultimately you take these different um, traditions and then you add your own uh, work to it and you create songs. So talk about your process of, of songwriting, if you could. Mm. Yeah, well, um, We've been writing music since we were kids. Uh, we are all, we used to all go to the same musical institute in Finland. Um, playing is not a hobby inside school, so we have a different educational system for for music and, and instrument lessons. But we went to the same musical institute and had the same contact teacher. And um, she made us compose quite a lot <laughs> since five year old. Maya has a nice compositions. Uh, she has kept from those first first ones she made uh but yeah i think maybe because we had the same teacher we have somewhat of a similar style of uh, composing none of us use really written like we don't use sheet music when we uh arrange these and practice as a band so um it depends on the song. Uh, I think last album everybody has written two pieces mm -hmm. of music and I had two pieces too and the other one was more well thought. I had an idea of how the uh, harmonies will go and what kind of elements I, we're going to use in the song and the other one I just wrote the melody mm -hmm. <laughs> and then the other ones, uh, other members helped to form yeah. arrange it, an arrangement to it and maybe you has composed some of the songs to be like yeah she had some her, even some sheet music yes yeah, she did have the harmonies written down for us because many times we just um 
try out that okay you're going to take the melody and the others are just going to try out a different type of harmonies and we just go on and on until it sounds good to everybody's ears so mm. so yeah that's maybe something um i think many times mm, we have the lyrics thought out before we start composing i don't know how you do it but i think i usually start with an interesting maybe traditional type of lyrics I found from an archive or um, some, yeah, usually I use some archive material for, for the lyrics. Mm. Yeah. And then sometimes make up some of my own to make it more smooth or the way I want to, mm. the way I want the story to go. Yeah, we were just talking about that uh, it doesn't actually matter what kind of a song you make and because it'll go through garden with machine and it'll right. sound like us no matter what's the like the first product that you will bring to the group because it might be really pop in the beginning but then when we kind of we alter it to sound like us then it doesn't sound like pop anymore or we don't mind it sounding popish because we like no. pop it's uh, one of our influences, so we're not mm -hmm. strictly mm -hmm. like traditional. And we think that folk music has always drawn from the popular music around mm -hmm. it, so it's uh, I think it's kind of pure <laughs> to also use any influence you have around you because that's that's and, what music and about, also because of Kantele how it sounds, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't sound. It, it will always sound like folk music a little bit because of the instrumentation. So. Yeah. We can do some really cheesy stuff, <laughs> and it doesn't <laughs> sound as cheesy as it would if, it, if the instruments were different. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, yeah, so all all of that makes total sense, and we I can see how that works. That you put it through first of all the prism of the band, and it mm -hmm. and it sounds like you, no matter what it was to begin with. And of course, the instrumentation and and singing styles and all of that make it not sound as poppy. And that's that's a uh, part of adapting the music of the world today into traditions they're all traditions whether they're you know pure folk traditions or not whatever whatever that may mean so mm -hmm. um thanks for that insight into your songwriting so let's talk a little about your shared history as a band because you you mentioned going to the same music institute and finland has a very impressive system of music education i think especially in traditional and folk music but also in all kinds of music so could you talk a little bit about your music school and how you all met there? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, we actually started playing Kantele in a musical play school. I think all four of us started as maybe four years old, but musical play school is, is not really <laughs> musical education in a way. But we did end up playing Kantele in the musical play school already. And um, I think, Quite a, many of us actually wanted to play some other instruments, <laughs> and uh, the the groups for those instruments for uh, you know small kids were full, and someone ended up um, recommending that oh kantele kantele is a parent friendly instrument it doesn't make harsh sounds even when you can't really play it yet, so I think maybe a part of this was some of our parents wanted an instrument that sounds nice at home when we are practicing. <laughs> <laughs> so we ended up in the musical institute and and playing the kantele. Yeah, and we had the same teacher son from the very beginning. And uh, I think we played uh, separately for maybe two years before forming Kardemi with. I think so. At different times. Uh, I think Maya already entered the uh, yeah, musical institute earlier, and so did you, but they are younger than us. So, so yeah, and like the band studies come a little bit later on in the education. So when we were, Anna and me, we were 10, uh, Maya was 9, and Yuta was 8 when we formed the group, and or when Sanna did, our teacher. So, and uh, I think we liked each other immediately. We formed a friendships and we that was kind of an excuse to get sleepovers 
that we were going to practice. <laughs> we had rehearsals, <laughs> but mostly we just ate candy and uh, yeah. like we did watched mu movies. Yeah, but we did play too. So it was kind of a I think from the early days of our kind of musical career, if you can call it that, at that point was maybe the community or the socializing uh, together that it was not only the music it was also yeah but then we had a like a uh, what do you call it awakening yes at the uh, around 2003 yes 2003 when we attended first ghosted and folk music festival as a band yeah so and then there we realized that we actually are really into this kind of music that we really want to we listened to it mm. a lot together and we had been we had been playing folk music because our teacher was a folk music teacher and still is uh, but uh, we didn't really we were not into genre in that way but that year 2003 Kaustin and folk music Fest festival had both Bertina and Vesem from Sweden so I think it was pretty epic for uh, the early teenage uh, girls as we were and yeah, it was very strong. Yeah, <laughs> after that we were more um, ambitious with that we wanted to also make this band something bigger or to compose songs like they do. Mm -hmm. and, and I think for all of us, uh, the library was very important. We had a good library near our, our musical institute. It had a very good music section. And I think uh, <laughs> all of us, we borrowed the same CDs. In different order so uh we had to listen through all the folk music nordic folk music section uh within those first few years of of that so so yeah and i think that's why we then ended up as professionals eventually that we just loved music and this type of music that we do mm -hmm. so we were in the musical institute until the end of high school uh and after after the high school, uh, we, me and Lenny, we went to Central Ostrobothnia, which is 500 kilometers northwest from here, from capital area. Mm -hmm. And we studied in the University of Applied Sciences. Uh, that's like a college. And we graduated as folk music pedagogues some five years later, four or five years later. And Jutta and Maya, they went to the Sibelius Academy here in Helsinki, which is our uh, only musical music university. And later I studied also here, yeah. but arts management. So. so Anna and Maya and Jutta are all masters of music. Mm. Wonderful. I and that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's it sounds very impressive to us. And one thing that we love to hear, of course, at the Library of Congress is that your library was very important to mm -hmm. uh, your being able to become musicians. Um, and that's that's so important to have uh, those resources available to people. So thanks for the, the shout out to your <laughs> to your local library. Of course, um, we, we absolutely love libraries. And, and my dream is to come to visit you in real life because I, I was so dis I mean, I we love it that we got to perform on this online event, but I, I I want to see the library. So. <laughs> well, we absolutely hope that you'll be able to come and visit us in person someday and we'll show you some of our Finnish resources, but also I'm sure you'll be fascinated by a lot of the other musical resources we have at the mm -hmm. Library of Congress. So thanks for that. And, you know, you mentioned uh, the Kaustinan Folk Music Festival and you mentioned Vajtina and Vesen from Sweden. It's it's a great um, sort of music scene that the tradition that traditional music has in the Nordic countries generally, and in Finland in particular. Um, my, one of my first kinds of exposure to to Finnish music was about twenty five years ago. I interviewed Vashtina when they first toured to the United States. So they've been doing this scene for a long time, and a lot mm -hmm. of other groups too. How was that? How did that influence you? Did you get to meet a lot of those? folks early on when you were still kids and talk to them and learn about the scene from them as well? Yeah, I think it was super important that we were into this kind of music that where you get to meet the people that you admire mm -hmm. and you get like a personal contact to them and they are willing to uh, share their knowledge and also your like the free time. Yeah, <laughs> sometimes <laughs> it's uh, I think it was wonderful in 
that sense that you get to meet your idols. So Bettina, for example, and also Vesen. And yeah, who would have? Uh, I don't think those little girls would have thought that some uh, what. Uh, 15 years later, we would be playing in in the World Music Institute in New York City together, a concert, and then drink beer with those guys. I don't yeah. think we knew that, but I think it's it's really lovely that in this genre, you uh, there is no no big gap between the audience and and the performers, mm -hmm. and we've tried to keep it that way also with our band that. Mm -hmm. It really warms our hearts when we go now to performing Kaustin and Folk Music Festival. And when you go outside some half an hour before the concert, you can see a line of, uh, of children and teenagers queuing for the concert. And that's that's really important to us. And yeah, it's heartwarming. And mm -hmm. also there's the jamming culture in, in the Nordic countries where you get to play with your also your idols. That's you, early on you can just attend a jam and play along and mm. get to know people and the tunes. So that's a really nice tradition. Yes, definitely. And, and you know, mentioning Vartina also brings something else up that's relevant to your group, which is um, there are many groups in Finland uh, in the traditional music scene who's, um, who's band leaders are women. There's a lot of, there's, you know, it seems... Uh, like a, a big part of the scene there. Can you talk about that a little bit, about being a women's group, among other things? Yeah, I think so. That's nowadays a lot of women, or the, like Sibelius Academy, I think I can't put percentage, like the right mm, percentage, but, but it's more, more than 50. More than 50 of uh, the people who are educated in there, at least when we were at school, were women and yeah, it's really important to see that women do this and also for us it's really important that we get to show little girls and kids uh, anyway and anybody really mm -hmm. that uh, women uh, do this as a profession and are equal to the men's yeah. groups. And in Finland it's a really lucky situation that we have a lot of uh, people to look up to that are women also, so not only men making music. Yeah, and it's important to us to be kind of uh, female figures that you can see that we are there and, and doing this job. But I have to say that when we began touring uh, more, mm -hmm. when we were in our early 20s, I think, uh, it did surprise me that uh, the sex is an issue, that, uh, our, uh, that I am not actually a musician, but I'm a female musician. And um, it's maybe... I, could, I can't say that Finland has reached equality. We have not reached yeah, equality. Yeah, it's sometimes even surprising how things don't work the way that you thought they would. Yes, so it's still it's visible in Finland that we are not equal. But sometimes when we started the touring, we were really surprised about that, it, it, that this is how how it's going to be that this is a thing that we are women and that we are kind of sometimes secondary <laughs> musicians somehow uh, not the top level or we are being seen as amateurs quite a lot sometimes mm -hmm. it feels like you are performing in a this big world music festival international right. biggest one in this state or in the part this part of the world and then you end up bumping into a sound technician that thinks you are doing your first sound check and they will <laughs> walk, <laughs> talk, you, talk you through like you've never been here right. and it feels sometimes a little bit uh, frustrating yes to start from that level but yeah. actually now i have to first convince the sound technician that i really can do my job right. <laughs> but right. yeah it's 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 not a struggle, but sometimes it's frustrating to uh, bump into your own, uh, like uh, something you cannot change uh, or over and over again. But it's it's also become important to us to to kind of raise awareness <laughs> how mm -hmm. we are really still on this field and and what could be there. Mm. Yeah, sometimes we call it mansplaining. You know, when, when men have, feel they have to explain things to women that they already know. Yes. <laughs> so, I have sometimes heard it, yes. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so you've 
toured now all over the world, really, um, <clears throat> starting out by touring Finland and then Europe, I, I guess, and then you've been to the United States, you've been to Japan. Um, when coming here to the U.S., have you encountered people with Finnish traditional music in their families? Have you have you found, you know, little pockets of Finland around the world? Yes, yes. Yeah, there are a lot of Finnish heritage people that come up to us and, and tell about their, uh, like, heritage. Uh, maybe not so many folk players, not so much I mean, but not not so many uh, play instruments actually. Maybe it was hard to transport Kantalas to the states, so yeah, not so many these days. But yeah, we've done uh, programs with uh, Arts Midwest. The folk fest program was all about actually the Nordic heritage uh, in in Midwest uh, smaller towns. So that was really. It was actually pretty exotic. <laughs> yeah, it was eye-opening too because we learned something new from Finland. Like uh, everybody came to us to say that they know one word of Finnish, and that was mojakka. And we had no idea what is mojakka. And uh, we had to, I don't know how long we had it to took. Google it. Yeah. yeah. Then, yeah, and it was also quite hard to Google also because in Finland we don't have Moyaka anymore. It's all traveled to the US. Uh, right. It's a traditional stew. Yeah, it's a stew, deer stew or fish stew, like a traditional thing, but we don't, we don't have it anymore. It yeah. apparently was some like small village culture in the Western Finland that made the people who had it close to their heart travel to the States and it survived there as an important Finnish thing and we have forgotten all about it. So. <laughs> So yeah, you also learn new about your own country. Yes, <laughs> and we met people who spoke Finnish like uh, like people in Finland spoke Finnish hundred years ago. Yeah. So it was very like very nostalgic to hear people who learned from their parents or grandparents and mm -hmm. never went to Finland since. But it has the language still could be really good, but it sounded very vintage mm -hmm. and so fascinating. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And, and as we've said, some of the music survived also, especially singing. As you said, the instruments didn't travel quite as well, but the songs are mm -hmm. still here. And we've recorded them in California and in Wisconsin and in Michigan. Uh, and we have recordings of, of Finnish singing. So it's really interesting to see those connections between uh, the Finnish music traditions and what we have in the U.S. Um, so Let's shift a little and talk about your recordings, because I know you have uh, now, what is it, five five albums that you've recorded? Yes. Um, yes. So talk about the process of becoming a recording artist. What was that like? Well, the first recording or the album, V Rise, from 2006, I think. And yeah, I don't know how, I think we we spent quite a lot of time collecting the money to be able to yeah. to make the first one yeah. because we were teenagers yeah, it, it wasn't uh, we didn't have any money but we I, I don't know what we did uh, well we did say we had concerts during the you know they didn't pay very well but we saved all in one bank account and then now our, we had a, I think our parents arranged a concert in one of the bigger concert halls here in our hometown Espo and mm -hmm. And then all our family members and, and friends had to pay yeah but the first fun. one first one wasn't uh, quite as maybe professional as the already the next four are, but, but it was really interesting, like before you were, uh, I was 16 or 15 when we recorded it. We were 17 when it came out. Yeah, okay. that Maya, they were 16, yeah. but it was kind of a studio right. live, mm -hmm. more like a studio live album. So it's a right. nice presentation of what, what kind of music we played. Yeah, it's quite like progressive <laughs> it sounds like yeah, um, yeah look, it's so uh, there are so long aesthetics in the songs uh, and lots of ideas too yeah a lot of ideas in one song <laughs> yeah it's interesting to hear like what you did when you were a kid and there's a lot of instruments also so mm. there we didn't sing as much um at that point or we didn't compose to singing as much so mm. that's why there are a lot of instrumentals there yeah and then yeah the next four are more Professional, yeah, but we are independent label, so we produce and and we do it all ourselves. We haven't seen a well. We mostly sell our CDs still in the wild touring, so it's been, yeah, yeah, yeah. thing for us to make them ourselves. So we get the best mm. out of it. 
now that we have the 20 years anniversary, we are probably going to make a like a compilation album or mm -hmm. album with a few of the older tracks, like newly arranged. So, and then some, of course, original music there too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we already had our anniversary uh, last mm -hmm. year, but because of the pandemic, we have a delay right. of it, the, the celebration. Yeah. So and we're fortunate here to have the Yes, but next year, next year. Yeah. Definitely. So um, I know one of your albums was um, was reissued by the Rough Guide. Did that give mm -hmm. you a little boost uh, in your career at that time? Yes, I think so. It was anyway uh, the busy years. <laughs> I think yeah. since 2013, we've been the became so much more international than we were. Obviously, we were mm -hmm. only 20 something or underaged <laughs> before it mm -hmm. so so it's hard to know which comes from which but i think it did boost us quite a lot yeah and it was a nice thing that people find our music maybe better because of of it i think there's quite many plays on spotify anyway mm -hmm. with that yeah. album and many come to complain if it's it's uh, regularly there's some bug that <laughs> that uh, bothers the album on spotify and then people send email that it's not working it's playing some <laughs> other band's music get it back on and then we are trying to explain but it's it's it, it, we can't do it we can't do it we, we don't know how to yeah yeah but you don't have any it's control so nice yeah. that it's so important that they go out and email us whenever it's not mm -hmm. working yeah yeah yeah. Well, I guess in that same year, your album, the, the album that you first issued in, in 2012 was won some major awards in Finland as as a, one of the, the Finnish folk album of the year, I think. Is that is that yeah. accurate? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. We so, won that title, which is really nice. Hmm. And I, I'll, I'll mention that that was the first one of your albums that I heard. Um, like got sent to me as a music journalist and I reviewed that album in the Huffington Post back in 2012. So, so Ooh, that was, that was wonderful music as well. And, uh, and so now since then you've gone on and, and released a couple of more, tell us about your latest, your most recent album. They are both done with the same sound technician and uh, somebody who's the sound technician, he's been touring also with us in the States quite a lot since then, maybe five times. Mm. So we have had a really nice cooperation with him. He's kind of, uh, he has his touch on our music mm -hmm. too, with, uh, some, some of effects. He's, he's not doing quite a lot of, you know, effects, but he does it in a very tasteful way. Subtle way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so those two, they are, um, maybe they are obviously the most mature albums we have so far, because we are major <laughs> We are kind of yet to grow up. But anyway, uh, yeah, only happiness is uh, the, fourth album it came out in 2015 yes mm. yes and that one is kind of it's i think this is something finnish people don't laugh about but whenever we talk about this uh outside finland people tend to laugh about it because it's called happiness but the songs are actually really sad <laughs> really sad and it is because of the maybe we are a melancholic nation we tend to we have weird sayings about like people who laugh or nothing will die young and <laughs> yeah if you are happy you should go and bury it very deep down so nobody knows and and it's a it's a little bit mm, and we tend to think that happiness is a thought that when i die the summer will go on and we call that happiness <laughs> so yeah it was kind of a concept album around this finnish happiness and we are the happiest nation in the world and we have no idea why everybody is asking everybody in Finland why are we why do you think that we are happy like are we happy are you happy <laughs> <laughs> but yeah we are really quite it doesn't happy show people. maybe on the outside but in the inside we are happy people yeah but we are happy girls singing sad songs sometimes right. and the uh, album the latest album so far midnight sun is uh, also it was supposed to be a christmas album or a winter uh, winter theme anyway winter theme album we had decided that oh we'll make a winter theme album but it was i think it was may when we were uh, composing, when we were composing. <laughs> so <laughs> instead it became a summer album but yes well yeah, it was. Uh, I think it was, was our Japanese agency that had wished for a winter theme album because we were going to tour there during December and it would be exotic and and so on. But it just music finds its way, and it was not yeah. a winter album. <laughs> uh, 
-hmm. And now Thank we are you. going to make a sixth one and we have planned it so that we will compose this next winter and then we will record again in May. So. Yeah, maybe maybe <laughs> we'll have a winter album this time. Yeah, we have to say to everyone that compose early so it will become a winter one. Right. Yeah, that having that lead time is always important. It's hard to know exactly when things will be ready. They don't happen on a schedule all the time, uh, recording mm -hmm. music. So, well, thanks for talking about your recordings. And, and there's there's one more um, issue that's, that's kind of fun and that you mentioned in some of your uh, pu publicity material. Could you tell us the story of the group's name, um, Karre Mimit? Ah, yes. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, in 1999 or 2000, I'm not sure which year it was. Probably 2000. Yeah, because we already had the band. Uh, we, our teacher, Sanna, who was really important to this project, she um, wanted us to have a name competition for the band so that everybody could vote, uh, her students and the students' parents voted for the best name. And I think everybody had two uh, like suggestions. suggestions maybe, so there yeah. were eight eight name suggestions mm -hmm. and Jutta's suggestion won, so Kardemim won and she won a, a bag of candy um, which we were really envious about like she didn't share much of it, yeah, I think no. she didn't open the bag there. yeah I think no, she just she put it in her backpack and didn't share it <laughs> when she wanted and later on we uh, learned that it wasn't Jutta at all who had uh, like invented the real name but instead her father and we were really pleased about that <laughs> and what the name means mm. it's a play with words uh we have a important spice that we use in mostly sweet uh bakings like uh, buns or cinnamon rolls type of things uh and it's cardamom cardamumma yeah it's used in indian food also maybe yeah. it's more common there. we don't know how it traveled to finland and became important right. to finnish people but it's here and it's important so cardamom and then mimmit means basically girls or chicks and because it was year 2000 and we were little girls so spice girls was an inspiration and we wanted to be spice girls too and apparently everybody else too thought that cardamom girls was a good name so that's what we are and it's sometimes people laugh at this name when you tell about in finland in nobody finland, knows no no one no one else knows the meaning but it's somehow a little bit maybe a childish a little name. bit childish name but since we've been that for 20 years we can't change it now and i think it's a good name and it's it's at least it's uh difficult enough <laughs> to pronounce uh, yeah. so no one will <laughs> think about the name about too much they're just trying to no. say it right <laughs> well if yeah. you think about it you've been here more than 20 years and if you stay on for another few years no one will remember the spice girls but cardamimit will be <laughs> famous <laughs> so <laughs> yes. so so that's what we're going to hope for so i think we're 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 running out of time so i would just like to thank you so much anna and leni did i get your names yes. close to right <laughs> thank you so much uh thank for talking you. to us and for being part of the Homegrown at Home concert series for 2021. We were so happy to be able to have you and wonderful also to be able to talk to you about your music. So thanks once again. Thank you. It was a joy.